Phoebe was a academic staff here, a lecturer for what, five years? Okay, in Sunway University. And you know, you'll be surprised that actually, when I wanted to speak to her to talk in this seminar, he had jumped ship and he left for another <coughs> university. Okay, uh, I've not found out the reason from her why she left, but uh, I believe she has gone for <coughs> a new environment and a new experience. You know? So that is fine, no problem with her. <coughs> she got a degree from La Trobe University in, in economics, I believe. <coughs> and, uh, she got a master's degree from Victoria University, and if she gets a PhD, there will be a PhD from the University of Mayer, supervised by me and supervised by my other colleague who is in the economics faculty, <coughs> UM, uh, Professor Raja Rasia. So she is actually very fine. Lah. Um, she will be speaking on the topic of her research, which is uh, the impact of r and on national development and so on. I think she has got very interesting results. But only, her, only she can present this morning because if she didn't turn up, I'll be in deep trouble. <laughs> Luckily, she's here today. So she will come to the podium and spend about one hour years uh, present and take your questions. Then I will come on board. Uh, I want to speak on the subject of university ranking. Uh, <clears throat> you may have heard so much about ranking, but I come here today to present you new developments in the ranking scenario. In particular, the faculty where I came from, which is the Faculty of Engineering UM, uh, recently made headlines, positive news, of course. The, the Ministry of Malaya Faculty of Engineering uh, recently was ranked the top 10 in the world. And all the responses that I saw in Facebook, as well, nobody believed it. <laughs> So I'm here to come and tell you all to believe it. Uh, I, I will show to you why this is true. But of course, this is ranked in the US News uh, World University Ranking. Uh, US News is uh, well known in the US. But apart from that, also the University of the Faculty of Engineering has done extremely well. I will show you, show you uh, those uh, achievements and I think it is very important for those who are in the academic world and especially to my friends with running Sunway University at the back there <coughs> to know why in a very short time the faculty of engineering which at one time had so much problems so much uh, racial divide and so on has become the top in the country by the way this one is beyond you know. and those days when it was making headlines with all the racial problems with so many trust failing and so on today it is the top in the country i think uh, you may want to hear from me uh, what is the secret of uh, overcoming those issues and how it has become number one you know no other faculties no matter it's engineering or medicine or <coughs> economics or what is better than the engineering faculty of the university of Malaya. That's what the ranking shows both in the US news and in QS ranking. So, so this is what I've come here to explain, the transformation that has happened there uh, and why it is like that uh, now, you know, and why maybe the other faculties has not made it. So I suppose that is interesting enough, like I mean, okay? I try myself to be very disciplined and to focus on the subject matter and not to be commenting too much like in my Facebook. Yeah? <laughs> uh, so now I'd like to welcome Phoebe Tan to come and tell about what you have been doing and what are your findings. You, know? you have to be here for one hour. Yeah? <laughs> Please, Phoebe. Welcome. Okay, good morning ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, my name is Phoebe. Uh, I've been supervised by uh, Tan Sri Gauf, Yeah, and together with Prof. Raja. Uh, both of them actually gave me a lot of support yeah, towards my PhD study yeah, for the last uh, two years, yeah, coming to my end of my third year now. Yeah, so uh, today I would like to take this opportunity to actually thank uh, JCI and JCI colleagues, especially to Tan Sri, uh, for inviting me to present my work on the critical role of R&D in university to advance Malaysia to become a, a scientific nation. So I think ultimately the motivation yeah, to actually uh, look at my study is stemming from the idea that R&D investment 
is especially science and technology is actually the source of uh, long-term growth and closely linked to the uh, country's economic performance. Okay? So in order to revolutionize the higher education system, the main argument that I wanted to uh, make in this talk today is the university must understand the crucial role in generating sufficient basic research and influence the basic research uh, to the next level, especially to the applied and to the prototype stage. Yeah, that means I only look at the critical role of uh, basic research. So I think if you do a search, you'll find that uh, it's not just happening in Malaysia, across different countries, including uh, China, Korea, and Taiwan, and uh, even in terms of Japan, even in US, you'll see that uh, most of the university and the government tends to uh, lack the focus on basic research. Yeah, so I wanted to re-emphasize that Malaysia, if they want to catch up with the developed nations, yeah, this is one of the critical roles. Okay. So, of course, uh, we also look at uh, this basic research can also forge uh, close partnership with the industry and government. Yeah? Okay. And also to boost uh, economic development and to create high quality jobs. So, when, you, when we keep on uh, looking at complaints that our talent is leaving, so I think uh, ultimately what I wanted to propose is uh, the government need to actually create high quality jobs. I think uh, creating the blueprint is not uh, the root cause to fix the solution. I think uh, ultimately I want to only look at uh, basic research. Okay. So I will also give you some of the facts that I found uh, in terms of uh, creating uh, Malaysia into high quality jobs. So uh, in terms of my motivations, I'm trying to look at uh, the basic research. Okay. So let's look at uh, in terms um, uh, basic research is actually conceptually part of the <coughs> national innovation system. Yeah, that means it's part of what we call the NIS. Yeah? And here, of course, we also look at uh, uh, basic research can also look at creation of new scientific ideas and, or knowledge which may or may not be commercialized immediately. Yeah? May not. So when people are trying to look at, I want to create a new basic research, yeah? uh, then people are trying to look at, uh, I can actually make a revenue or profit out of it immediately. So I can actually show you from my facts and my study with that we, we actually have a lagging effect. Yeah? There's actually a lagging effect. So it also serves as a basis for commercial products and applied research in the long term. So we say that university can actually foster innovation by upscaling their research capabilities and laboratories to stay financially sustainable, to attract more investment and also uh, to create uh, more employments. So the notion of uh, leapfrog uh, which commonly used today or even to catch up with the developed countries would not be possible without the investment in basic research or the role of government in, in coordinating this activity productively. Okay, so what you see here is you can actually see some proxies. I think proxies is important. Uh, without proxies, of course, today if you ask me, this list is, uh, there's a very long list that I have. So for this talk purpose, I just want to focus on this few proxy that you see yeah, on the screen today. Okay? So namely, of course, uh, you have R&D expenditure, which uh, we normally term as gross expenditure in R&D. We have business and also from the government. Yeah? Uh, of course, we also have R&D personnel. Uh, we have all the scientists, engineers and researchers. Uh, we also have higher education spending in terms for enrollment and graduates. And here also we have R&D output. Uh, we can look at uh, patterns. We can look at industrial designs. Uh, we can look at royalties. And we also have SCI, uh, the science and technology policies. Uh, we, also, we can have intellectual property rights. We can have uh, knowledge hubs, uh, clusters. Uh, we can also have uh, uh, seed fundings, et cetera. Yeah, there's many components that you can look into SCI policy. Okay. So from table one, of course, uh, this is based on recent I, uh, IRI research. You can see that um, uh, in terms of academia, they actually spend highest allocation of uh, the GERD, yeah? the gross expenditure on research and development, which account for almost 56% uh, yeah? on basic research. But if you look at uh, the contradicting story, I think which we need to give you the uh, realistic is, when you come into uh, Asia, yeah, because uh, ultimately just now what you saw was globally, when we look at Asia, we still are uh, rather left behind in terms of uh, basic research uh, compared to the US. And worse still, yeah, uh, which you can look at if worse still, if we, this one includes uh, China, Japan, and South Korea, Taiwan, Singapore. So if we take out these uh, five uh, 
uh, Asian performers, then you'll be able to see uh, definitely the percentage will be even worse off. Yeah. So clearly, if you try to look at in terms of Malaysia, uh, Malaysia uh, uh, needs to play an important role in Asia to increase the higher education and uh, science and technology related spending to translate <coughs> into competitiveness yeah, of the country. So this was from my previous, so uh, every year I try to keep track of uh, IRI and other sources, yeah, how Malaysia has progressed. Yeah, of course, this is not the only uh, sources that I look at. Yeah? So what I try to see is in the past and comparatively, what you look at is Malaysia has been very slow and if we fast forward, Malaysia has actually uh, improved. Yeah, Malaysia has actually improved. So uh, you can see from the government, they actually tell you that they spend more. Uh, there's also more uh, researchers, there's also more scientists, and you also there's uh, in terms of uh, uh, the companies of the country. Yeah. So here, of course, we can see that uh, Asia is also growing. Yeah, relatively means ultimately we see that in terms of uh, Asia R&D, Asia has actually shown substantial growth in R&D over the last five years. Yeah, which account uh, now, including the five Asian performers, actually account for 42% uh, globally of uh, R&D. And countries like China and South Korea, uh, which is part of my study, used to be very poor agriculture economies, has actually successfully transformed uh, into industrial or innovation giants today. Uh, so um, they also have uh, built very successful uh, science park or cluster uh, you can also see some of the uh, names that I put on the screen. Of course, uh, when I visited uh, Boston last year, you can also see there's actually a Boston uh, Route 128, yeah, which is the biotech firms. Uh, we have uh, uh, Taiwan's uh, Sinchu, yeah, the, uh, one of the important science park to Taiwan. Of course, in terms for Singapore, what you try to look at is they actually connect with the university. Like in Taiwan, they actually connect with the National Tsinghua University, uh, National Chowton University. And uh, Singapore actually has a uh, biopolis and one off uh, that actually connects uh, NUS, the NTU city campus, and also Singapore Polytechnic. That means we try to look at there's actually an important role uh, for university to play in basic research. And of course, in the case of uh, China, uh, I actually evaluated, um, they have a, there has actually a sudden bloom of science park in the country. And I actually study a lot on the Chung uh, Chun. Yeah, the one of they call the China Silicon Valley. Yeah, uh, very important. Which uh, uh, partly grow because of Tsinghua University uh, Science Park. They call Tus Park. And of course, we also have very niche uh, policy, which is the program uh, 973, which is actually a specific program in China to boost the basic research. That means uh, the government need to have a basic uh, research plan. Yeah, so if we see how the five country performer, so which you can see like South Korea and even Japan, yeah, South Korea actually has a 577 program. Yeah, yeah. We are trying to look at uh, government need to develop a basic research uh, policy and the actions that are underlying. Yeah, so by creating just uh, science, uh, science uh, in terms of ministry, you, you need to have a specific area into basic research. Yeah? Um, of course, uh, I can also give you for facts that our basic research is actually six times slower than our, uh, very much six times slower. Uh, it, it could be slower of even uh, subsequently, yeah, if, uh, if we try to do a longer series. So if our, our basic research is already six times slower for the last 20 years, uh, so how would Malaysia go forward if we do not actually set up the right policies in place? Okay. So, of course, uh, we try to look into the important aspect uh, for university. Yeah? Uh, so, as an academic staff, of course, I wanted to realize how the higher education spending can actually turn into scientific research hub. So, uh, the university actually need to look forward to create new industry, yeah, to actually need to prepare industry, uh, the transplantation, revitalize the old industry to new by filling the structural gaps, uh, which are what we call uh, skilled base, yeah, and uh, finally to upgrade the mature industry uh, by providing more consultations, uh, to do more contractual research, or even to adopt best practices from uh, other countries uh, to boost innovations in Malaysia. Okay, 
uh, based on my research, of course, you can see uh, these are some of the theories. Yeah, the, of course, the amount of theories. These are mainly uh, the evolutionary the, uh, yeah, in terms. So from these theories that you see, we are trying to conclude that they actually relate extensively on the importance of innovation and human capital development. Yeah? Uh, most of their past study, they only, uh, although they are using different techniques, they, they all try to relate uh, the importance of innovation to human capital development. And we see that uh, technology diffusion will impact the country's long-term growth. Yeah? So you will see that basic research, uh, we are trying to only connect with long-term. So if we try to simulate any short-term kind of uh, benefits or trying to predict any short-term kind of relationship, uh, the story will not give you, uh, a very, uh, will not paint you a very good relationship after all. Okay? So here, of course, we also say that uh, R&D generates knowledge that prevents decreasing return to scale. Yeah, so we are trying to actually at least uh, capitalize yeah, on this research. And more precisely, of course, you will see that a 1% increase in higher education will actually increase GDP by 0.9%. Yeah? And uh, if you go more detail, if a government spend a 1% increase in GERD, GERD is actually the gross expenditure in R&D, will actually increase GDP by 0.6%. And if you actually spend 1%, uh, in patterns, yeah, one percent increase in patterns will actually increase GDP by eleven percent. So, why do you see a lot of pattern generations from basic research? It's easier to stimulate growth even more. Yeah. Okay. So from here, we say that the pattern intensive industry is important uh, for Malaysia, and of course, furthermore, uh, geographic proximity to the frontier firms to speed up the cash up process is also important. That means uh, we need to actually uh, relook at our cluster again. Yeah, we need to relook at our cluster. And a thousand dollars on this research education uh, per person raises patterns per person by six per one hundred thousand when university and firms reside together yeah, at the technology frontier. So uh, after all the nice story, you saw that the, uh, the is able to increase the growth for the country, able to increase the economic performance. But what normal most of the country, including Malaysia, that spend less on basic research, was because you see that there is actually a high time lag to uh, capitalize this investment. So based on the past research, at least six to seven years, yeah, six to seven years in order to look at uh, the R and D expand that turns into profit generation. So many countries have actually spent uh, less. So if you actually look at statistics, you can put any sources of statistics, you'll be able to see that uh, the spending of basic research typically fall. Yeah, typically fall. So what happened here is I tried to actually, uh, this is uh, the good uh, spending for Malaysia. So you will be able to see why Korea has actually surpassed most of the country. And the red line here is actually Malaysia. So I tried to actually uh, use uh, uh, Rosenblum, uh, yeah, uh, I can't use the original production function, uh, Douglas. So from Rosenblum, uh, of course, I purely look at also uh, in terms of the, the lag effect as well, yeah, the lagging effect. So I also will use a triple helix model. Uh, triple helix is important to, to actually look at the university, governments and industrial. Uh, all the linkages in the cluster, and to also look at uh, Prof Go. Yeah, Prof Go is also from uh, UM. Uh, in he has a model on FDI leveraging model. So I will explain why Malaysia need to look at this FDI leveraging. Yeah, leveraging model. Okay, as a university catch up. So as a basis of my conceptual analysis. So you'll be able to see that uh, in the in the past studies. Yeah, again we can look at uh, there's actually a positive uh, relationship in the long run between uh, patents growth and uh, GDP growth. Yeah, pattern. Okay. So uh, the basis of this study is actually to identify the long run relationship between the selected variables. And uh, we either use a theory and also use uh, the uh, autoregressive distributed lag approach yeah, in order to try to model the results. So according to uh, Prof Go, uh, according to Prof Go, uh, recent study, uh, the late industrializing economies like South Korea, uh, in, uh, they actually use the import substitution, the export promotion, and also the Chebos firm and the Taiwan actually leverage on the OEM and the ODM uh, perspective in order to emphasize on the techno entrepreneurial activities and to develop the locally owned manufacturing industries 
And also, while in the case of Singapore and Malaysia, we actually use the FDI leveraging countries uh, to give priorities to the developed institution like the operations of MNC. So for Singapore and Malaysia, we actually look at uh, the MNCs that can facilitate the operations and the spillover of technology to the local subsidiary firms. Yeah? So that's why we must use the FDI leveraging model because uh, we typically from the 1980s onwards, 1990 onwards, when we start to build all these electronic uh, different clusters, we are actually leveraging on this multinational to spill over the, to the local firms. Um, the Malaysian government also facilitate the multinationals, uh, the technology learning during the early cash up period. So here, of course, we, we say that uh, the industrial technology actually grew from the simple manufacturing operations in the 1970s uh, to high value added uh, products and manufacturing act, uh, activities, uh, R&D uh, in the early 1990s and higher education investment in the basic research activity also grew during that time. So during the last uh, the 20 years, even uh, fast forward now, the 20 years later, we see that as uh, the number of uh, science, technological, uh, higher education spending, there's also investment, higher investment in basic research activity. Okay. So from here, I try to actually uh, model uh, uh, using the, 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 the lagging effect. So here, of course, you can see that, okay, first I explain what is the model. So in this model, of course, you try to look at uh, this YT, the dependent variable actually has a lagging effect, yeah, and uh, based on my uh, various different variable. So I use this, uh, this model we call ARDL. Uh, it's actually to look at, uh, to test the presence of uh, long-run relationships. Uh, and uh, we can also identify uh, in this time series some short-run dynamics. So this T minus 1, which is the lagging effect, can actually determine uh, what is the lag length uh, to, explain, uh, uh, to explain the distributed lab model. And here also another, why I use this model is because I can also observe the, if there's any change sign from positive to negative or negative to positive. Yeah, I want to see lagging effect. Because why uh, from the past, we actually see that they're as high as seven years, right? In the Malaysian case, is it still as high as seven years? Yeah, so ultimately, I wanted to give you some of the facts. Okay, so I have these few variables with me. Of course, uh, all these uh, various uh, independent variables has its own lagging effect. But merely, I'm looking at what is the significant predictor in the case of Malaysia. Okay, so of course, uh, uh, I try to model the trend. Uh, in particularly, I'm trying to look at our patterns and industrial design yeah, over the past uh, 20, 20 years and beyond. So upon that, of course, I got my result uh, in terms of if we try to do a modeling for the result without looking at the significance of each individual uh, predictor yet. So you can see that, of course, in the case of uh, industrial design, industrial design is actually important because it uh, starts to give a positive influence to the economic performance in the case of Malaysia. Yeah, industrial design. Industrial design is actually part of uh, basic research. Okay. So why I emphasize this because I can have uh, this kind of, I can have human capital and I can see the lagging effect because we can have a pre-employment scientific staff, right? So so our graduates is what we term as the pre-employment scientific staff. So I can see the lagging effect before they actually start to capitalize this revenue. But however, if I want to look at okay, well. well perhaps uh, what can speed up the process. I think industrial design is important as well, yeah, as part of the higher education. So of course, uh, here, um, if I go further into my significant uh, predictors, I can see that from the industrial design, uh, it's actually uh, true because in the case of Malaysia, you can see that uh, at least on average, there's actually uh, three years, yeah, three years in order to capitalize uh, the effect. Yeah, so I can run a nine years, I can run a 12 years series, and on average, you'll be able to see uh, around yeah, two to three years you can capitalize. But my concern is if the government start to reduce the amount of uh, basic research spending, uh, I doubt that this, uh, this more, uh, the, the, they are able to catch up, yeah, with, especially with the developed country. So um, from here, of course, uh, we can go further uh, into uh, each of the, we can even predict more, yeah, each of the, various variable and the dependent legs, yeah? 
Uh, so in terms for uh, uh, looking at the uh, concluding remarks, so of course I like to say that uh, basic research are in this uh, long-term investment activity uh, to emerging economies like Malaysia, should the country wish to catch up with the developed countries. So this is also supported by the fact that the model has actually explained 66% uh, uh, variations in the economic performance. Yeah. So of course I wanted, uh, I mean, maybe one thing I want to highlight is uh, I would agree if let's say you were to ask me that basic research is not the only predictor to GDP. Fully agree. Yeah, but I think we need to go deeper to find the root cause yeah, that uh, drive uh, economic performance. And specifically, I look at uh, industrial design has actually positive influence in the case of Malaysian scene to look at the variations in economic growth. So, but we need to have a speedy realization of the benefits. So 1% increase in the industrial design as the basic <coughs> research will actually increase Malaysian GDP by 0.08%. Yeah, that means it actually create a positive growth and you also saw that uh, uh, T minus 3 and T minus 6 is actually uh, statistically significant. So we reinforce that the industrial design is actually a crucial uh, step in R&D to measure the university performance. Yeah, that means a uh, university has a role to play to create the basic research because uh, this is where the creation of knowledge is. Yeah, it's actually, and to also to help the industry to upgrade. Yeah, in terms of best practices. So here, uh, this will actually allow more innovative teaching and research. It is also the important pre-trial stage for scientific workforce to inquire a single and multiple embodiment into one concept before the patent's application. Yeah. So because what happened right now, if you try to look at the statistically, uh, we have more non-resident patents than resident patents. That's why earlier on I was giving you a figure that we are already six times slower yeah? and we anticipate to be slower. So if you see that Malaysia is on the FDI leveraging model, it looks like the trend that Malaysia is going to have more non-resident patterns going forward. We can do a simulation 10, 20 years, 30 years. But if we purely look at Malaysia uh, started with a FDI leveraging model and continue with this model, it looks like our non-resident patterns yeah, will surpass. Okay, so we will never be a model like uh, Taiwan and South Korea, yeah, it's because there's a huge gap in building the resident patterns, yeah, especially in basic research. So uh, here we would uh, like to look at uh, this important process uh, so that we can actually increase the productive capacity on basic research as the core function of the university, yeah, as the core. Okay, so in terms of concluding remarks, in terms, uh, of course, this is something that I intend to do further in my research. So uh, I wanted to study, in, in the case of Malaysia, uh, the government always wants to attract uh, various talents. And I try to classify them into three groups. The first one is uh, foreign talents from overseas. This is what, uh, in terms of Talent Corp, is trying to do. Of course, Talent Corp is also trying to uh, basically uh, uh, Track our Malaysians' uh, talents overseas, yeah, to contribute back to the uh, Malaysian economy. However, we also wanted to see that it would be easier if I say that the Malaysian government try to tap on group number three. That means whoever are the foreign talents that already in Malaysia, yeah, because why we are trying to build an education hub, yeah, we are trying to build a lot of successful cluster. If you see Silicon Valley, if you see in terms of the China Silicon Valley, there's actually massive uh, foreign talents. Yeah, that actually contribute to their success. So if you tap on the foreign talents in Malaysia, we, we actually have a sort of uh, motivation from this group of social capitals, uh, the norms, yeah, the trust, uh, the, pet, the, the, the experience that they can actually transpire within the cluster. So, uh, so of course, uh, if we can actually tap into this third group, we say that uh, we can also anticipate um, there's actually a larger positive spillover effect. Yeah? Uh, from this, uh, from this group, because if scientific discipline can remain the leading profession. So today, if, you, if we simulate any graduates figure, you'll see that the science and technology related, the number of graduates are falling across different universities, public to private. So I think I wouldn't want to name who. Yeah? So when I do my simulation, I can continue to do forecasting. You only will see that uh, the science related uh, discipline will continue to fall and the social science will continue to rise. 
but we have a problem yeah because we still have to look at the basic research so uh, and of course uh, if this doesn't build uh, the, the the ultimately to build more resident patterns would also fail so there's actually two caveats uh, in terms to reap this opportunity because we have slower uh, industrial design and slower resident patterns and uh, we also unable to groom our local talents and even unable to retain this social capital. Yeah, that means we try unable to actually retain the talents or even tap on this social capital, the foreign talents that we have. Uh, we will not see uh, somehow Malaysia is able to catch up with the developed countries. That means there's still a massive spending yeah, in terms of education and research, but uh, the commonization is high. So we suggest that uh, to look at this foreign talent, that means this is still something that perhaps uh, Talent Corp or other ministry has not really uh, tapped on to them yet, yeah, successfully today. Yeah. So uh, with that, uh, uh, thank you. Yeah. Of course, uh, my research, uh, I have more detail, yeah? and that means uh, because this is actually one of my uh, hypotheses. Yeah, actually, yeah, within the given time, uh, this is just one of my hypotheses. So uh, I have three. And of course, one of the areas that I try to show you was I try to look at human capital. Human capital, we always term that as they have the tacit knowledge, right? But I think if you build uh, into a cluster into a, and you actually put them into this social capital, so, uh, the norms, the experience can actually be capitalized faster. And this is actually one of the success of uh, uh, the scientific uh, parks like Silicon Valley and others country. Yeah. Uh, your equation explains only 66%. Are you comfortable to make a conclusion? Because you got about one third unexplained. Huh? Don't you think you should do further research on uh, independent variable? Uh, maybe a single equation, maybe the determinant is a, uh, like a system equation, simultaneously determined. Yeah? So, uh, for, to me, it was different. I may not want to make a conclusion based on R squared 66%. And I put more research work to find what are the 34% that I do not explain. Uh, to make conclusion based on 66%, to me, uh, I'm very uncomfortable. I will do more. Uh, research work. Yeah? Now, on the other one, my observation is that uh, you conclude that many students do not opt for science and technology, maybe because we are going for service driven economy. My previous talk by Tan Si Lin Sien, we mentioned about service driven may not be uh, the way. Yeah? So, our manufacturing is not uh, increasing. No? So, manufacturing are going to Vietnam, going to other places where the cost of energy is cheaper. Yeah? So, uh, graduate from science, uh, from engineering, what, what do they do? They do manufacturing. So, obviously, they go for service, hotel management, and then sales, and all that. Yeah, maybe that will explain to you why the student do not offer science. Thank you. Okay. Uh so um, uh, basically, I actually have another hypothesis that I'm looking at publication papers. Uh, in terms of paper, we look at this is uh, how we disseminate the knowledge. Yeah. So from basic research, uh, of course, this is the practical work, and how we actually diffuse knowledge is the the another part that explain the thirty four percent. Yeah. So in terms of paper publication, so that will actually I won't say my model is perfect, uh, but I think my model try to look at what happened in the Malaysian scene and what we can help the country. So uh, now what happened is the reverse. We have a lot of publication. I think we will agree, right? That's why our ranking all grew. Yeah, we are happy for the country. But what happened was uh, we are actually giving away our basic research. So I try to look at the 66% first before I try to look at the 34% which is on papers publication. Yeah, so, yeah. I'm familiar with some of the yeah. factories in Singapore in the oil and gas industry. Mm -hmm. And uh, I see there are a lot of Malaysian technical personnel there. Yeah. Some as high as 40%, you know, yeah. in the factory. And why are they working there and not in this country? Yeah. Oh, first question today. And then there seems to be an anomaly. There seems to be an anomaly your uh, presentation just now. I hope you can explain it. You see, mm. the number of uh, engineers per capita in Singapore is higher than in Malaysia. True. Okay? So, yet you find, you go to factories, you find plenty of Malaysians there. And then, um, you talk to the Singaporeans, young Singaporeans, they seem to be more interested in jobs in Shenton Way. Mm. It's just like, 
British boys and girls being more interested in working in the square mile in the city in London rather than London. That's why they have a problem with STEM education in the uh, UK as well. Mm. Okay. So I hope um, you can shed more light. I hope you can shed more light and I hope you can agree in future lectures on this kind of uh, problems, which uh, to me not only uh, exist uh, in isolation in this country, but it seems to be related to our neighbour because it seems to be drawing away all our engineering talents. And uh, also, you know, uh, it seems to be a worldwide problem that, uh, like you say, more and more people are going for social science rather than for the uh, you know, science and uh, applied science. So I, I hope you agree that give us more of your knowledge about these things in future. Thank you. <coughs> Okay, I think um, maybe I just give my personal view uh, because I also used to be a PR of Singapore. So I think if it's not because of personal reason, maybe I become, uh, I'll probably become a resident there as well. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, although I'm not a scientific graduate, uh, but I think um, the ecosystem of the country is important. But of course, we also see that uh, Singaporeans also leave their country as well. Yeah, working abroad. So what I wanted to call, uh, basically say is uh, we can't uh, avoid cross-border migrations of talents uh, because they try to gain more experience. They actually try to connect with other social capital. So I think earlier on when I say that uh, why government need to tap on social capital is important because every different country, whether Malaysia, Singapore, and China, or even US, there's actually this group of foreign talents in the country. So can we actually tap on them in order to create more uh, resident patterns? Yeah? Can we actually tap on this to create more? Rather than we just look at the multinationals yeah? as the FDI leveraging cap. Yeah. So here, of course, uh, what I have, uh, when I try to do some interviews with uh, some of the students, or why they used to, in their high school, they actually science students, and when they come to university, they actually take up social science because they always term as uh, science studies or engineering or technical or any kind of biotech studies are difficult. So, uh, of course, together as academics, we need, or together with the ministry, we need to correct this perception. That means until today, the younger generation, our future generation, always regard uh, scientific study as very difficult, very challenging very long times to study, right? That means in terms of graduation period, in terms of difficulty, it's harder. So unless you have the passion, yeah, unless you have the passion, so uh, then you will continue to see the number of graduates co continue to fall yeah, in science-related study. Yeah, that means the perception from our future generation is they, are, they always think science-related study are difficult, very challenging. So social science is the better alternative. Yeah? They, can, is it, they can go out to work uh, in a short period of time. Yeah. So I think it's the, the perception that has pain. Uh, and how do we uh, correct this perception? But I would like to actually look at it in a more general. Uh, what is happening in this country in terms of research? Okay, today, actually, our theme actually on uh, spearheading national development through uh, quality research. And you talk about, uh, about basically the fundamental of it. Um, Probably you can enlighten me a little bit on. Um, uh, there are a lot of there are twenty public universities in the country, and not to talk about. Uh, now. Sorry, twenty one now. Oh, that's the last one. I'm not aware of that. And also many uh, private universities like uh, Sunway, which is uh, doing very well in terms of knowledge creation and so on. Um, but we, when we talk about research, you know, basically I remember when I was in the Ministry of Education, we did a lot of research because. I was also from, from uh, EPRB Planning and Research Division, uh, then as an officer. A lot of research being done uh, within the ministry itself. <coughs> what happened to the research after that, I have no idea. They are all compiled in the library, nicely. <laughs> Stack, you can go, if you want to do your PhD, you want to do further research, you can go and look at it, and then you produce again another research findings. So likewise, in the country, we the country spent less last year by spending this coming year, probably a little bit more in terms of research they are giving, and also industries are more aware that they need to participate in uh, uh, giving uh, research fund, uh, fundings to enable them to grow. I want to know really uh, the ministry, because I'm, I'm relating to the government. We talk about nation building, we are talking about the government. They are the ones that are making policies, they are the ones that is charting the future direction of our country. How 
much of uh, research that has been created, uh, whether it is basic uh, research and so on, that has been capitalized by the government. Uh, because what you can see, sometimes the government will come up with some new policy direction, new things uh, that's supposed to be actually uh, good for our country, but no findings or research, uh, specific research being mentioned. This is actually, we do it based on this particular research or what it is. And universities, I think, are public, public universities, they have done well generally. Uh, we have produced great, and I'm really very proud that uh, we have actually grown, we have achieved a lot more for the last four or five years. But uh, let me know, actually. Uh, because when I, I never heard really, really specifically when we did certain new policy, like whatever you want to say, I don't want to mention it's rather sensitive here. Which research did they refer to? Because many of the transformation, many of not transformation, many of the uh, policy, new policy direction of, or uh, what you call this, uh, they change certain things, uh, not really based on research. So this research that we have done by people like you, clever people like you, uh, the thinking that we have, how are they being capitalized? Because I don't know which ministry, they do have Ministry of Science, uh, or whatever it is in the, in the Prime Minister's department. But I do not know who are sitting there, whether do they know anything about research at all. You know, uh, probably they were former doctors. <coughs> that is one question I would like to ask. Secondly, uh, we talk about, I'm also, my background is social science. Um, uh, as a former public uh, servant before, I'm aware and um, that at the end of it, why many people would rather choose to do social science instead of science uh, subjects. I think one of them was my daughter from science stream. She decided, I said, I'm going to do law. So you switch, you know, halfway. But of course, it's a lot easier for them. Um, I think basically at the end of it, in this country, in Malaysia, who are the people who are making actually policy decisions in this country? Who are the people who dictate that you can be promoted, you cannot be promoted, you can be a public servant? They are social science graduates. They are not science graduates. So you have one great uh, officer, great doctors, in one public, uh, what is this, public uh, hospitals in our country who are actually giving themselves fully, but they are not being recognized. So you have a lot of transformation like the Ministry of Education, which I was partly involved actually, in changing uh, the education landscape, changing what we're going to achieve, doing so many things in 2020, uh, by 2025, or whatever it is. But what is happening in the system itself, whether these people are going to be playing the role, are giving that platform uh, to be able to transform the education itself. I'm uh, giving you one example, sorry, you're giving one example. Transformation in uh, district offices, probably, this, game, this is what I'm familiar with. So they want to do transformation, they can play a role. You must be the one that is uh, spearheading and telling people what you do and monitoring your teachers and tell your education directors. But their position is very much lower than education directors and directors in the ministry itself. So you have no local standard. Who are you to tell these people? They will tell you, you just shut up. You got, what are you? You are a lower ranking officer. You are telling us what to do. So it is not like other countries. So um, uh, this is basically my, my opinion and through my own experience as well. Thank you. Actually, point I agree with you. You know, when I actually wanted to do this uh, topic, um, the initial side, uh, I mean, when I tried to bring this topic to University of Malaya, they are saying that uh, we cannot measure R&D properly. So I continue to pursue this topic because I felt that Malaysia has, we have not really find the root cause. I'm not saying that whatever I've done in my thesis, uh, can solve Malaysia's problem. Yeah, I mean the policy making is important. Uh, what is also missing from my model is the IPR laws. So if you see uh, this, what I intend to do. So I know where the limitation of my research. Uh, I actually intend to do look at the IPR law as well, which is important to build uh, the successful uh, basic research policy. Right, the IPR laws. Um, so in terms, uh, when you when when actually one say that uh, R&D. Um, has uh, no info, right? That means every time they, they, where is the things they try to capture? I also have hard time trying to match back that where is the basic research. It also has taken me a lot of effort in order to to collect the data, yeah, in order to do some modeling. So when I try to do the modeling and it try, it give me that the uh, industrial design has actually been slowing down, 
and uh, we find that it's actually one of the important steps for university or even for government to look at uh, not to deter uh, or to uh, impede the uh, growing of basic research. So I think the R and D information is imp uh, it must be transparent. That means uh, how many basic research, how many applied research, what are basic research, all this, uh, it must be readily uh, information very available. Yeah, that means and the progression of uh, stage to stage. Yeah, on all these R and Ds. So I actually encourage the uh, the transparency of this info. Yeah, going forward, and of course, uh, in terms of policy setting, I I still think that Malaysia has uh, many uh, room to grow. You know, that means in terms of our IPR policy, let's say we try to put everyone into an incubation hub. So who owns the pattern? Example, if we created a, a product out, a design, industrial design, is this owned by the university or is this actually owned by the firm? Let's say the multinational firms, for example, right? or our local firm. So I think this one is, uh, is, con is at, the, at the moment uh, very much unclear. That means uh, if we want to tap on this social capital, the next thing is to make sure that uh, who owns uh, this industrial design or these patterns, right? Um, so I'm rather um, sensitive to the values that the numbers that you provided just now. For example, uh, you mentioned that basic research, our basic research in Malaysia is six times lower than that of uh, overseas. So probably can you just um, elaborate a little bit more as in why is it six times lower and what can we do to be on par or at least not six times lower than that of overseas? And then uh, you said that in a fundamental research, it takes about seven years to really see the results. So what do you expect after seven years? Do you expect basic research to be uh, applicable research or industrialized research? Or uh, what is it that we should expect after seven years? And then in the last two slides, you mentioned that there are three categories that we should attract into Malaysia. The first two categories are the foreigners and also Malaysians residing overseas. And the third category is the foreigners in Malaysia. I just wonder if you think that the local talent in Malaysia is uh, satisfied with uh, what we are having in terms of research at the moment. Do you have a fourth group for this? Thank you. I think in terms of the six times slow, I mean statistically this is what I found. Right, so this why I try I try my best to pre, uh, look at the past trend was uh, they say that it's very hard for me to find R and D information. So I don't believe that. So that triggered my thought to do this research. So when I did this research, as well, I found that in the case of Malaysia, I'm not saying that other countries are having the same. What I found that same with Malaysia and other country is uh, the amount spent on basic research is falling. That is uh, one thing for sure. The trend is the same. But in the Malaysian scene, our, our so-called uh, industrial design is actually six times slower. Yeah, six times slower than all this, uh, and actually it's 15 times slower in terms of compared to pet, uh, trademark creation. So Malaysia actually focused on just, uh, just trying to trademark all these products or services. So if we look at between industrial design all the way to trademark, we are 15 times slower. So can you see the amount of spending? So uh, when I just trying to relate uh, from the first stage, the basic research to the applied research, this is already six times slower. If we fast forward, yeah, trying to look at the prototyping, the, the trademark side, actually is 15 times slower. That draw a very uh, uh, serious story. Yeah, that means uh, something is not right because uh, th the first initial two stage must be stronger. Yeah, comparatively to trademark. So from seven years, of course, in the case of Malaysia, it's not true. Uh, that is just uh, in generic studies. Uh, in the case of Malaysia, we, you can see from modeling perspective, uh, we can actually uh, capitalize them in uh, on average three years. In the case of three years, yeah, that means you can start to see positive investment on average uh, three years. Yeah, in the Malaysian scene. But what I was worried was um, the the slowing down of our basic research. Yeah, that means in terms of spending on basic research is slowing. The growth rate in terms of producing more basic research is also falling. And we do not actually have a, a specific policy on basic research. That means just now when you see uh, the China, yeah, we actually have the 863 and the, the, uh, in terms of the 973 program. In Korea, we have 577 program. Right? These are all important. This policy is purely on building basic research. 
it's not a generic national science science and technology policy. That means, uh, in the case of Malaysia, I try to find a specific uh, a, a specific national policy regarding basic research plan. I cannot find. I mean, someone can always enlighten me. Yeah. So for the last two years, I've been trying to find a specific. I can have mostly, you know, I can have all a, I can have ASM, all kind of ministry coming in, right? Uh, and nowadays, you also have uh, entrepreneurs. You have magic. Everyone trying to create a new seed developments. But I still cannot find uh, where is our basic research uh, policy that can steer Malaysia ahead. That means we need a specific <coughs> policy. And that's how I see the five Asian performer group. That means they grew, it's not because uh, they have more superior science and technology uh, policy compared to Malaysia, because Malaysia, also, we also have very good policy. But I think we, we, we need to go deeper to look at a specific uh, policy like uh, the basic research. Yeah, that's, uh, that is why. That's what I'm going to uh, propose. Yeah, that means uh, we, we need to go uh, back into the root cause and look at basic research again. Yeah. So here, why I say seven years is because uh, it is hard to uh, it's, it's hard to actually profit, yeah, to earn revenue because it's long time lag. But it looks like in the case of Malaysia, you do not need seven years. So I was wondering why the Malaysian government do not do it, since we only has on average three years. Uh, I have a couple of questions for you. One, you mentioned about increase in research and improvement to GDP growth, the correlation. Are there specific industries or areas that uh, in your research you found? And related to that, how, has, uh, how would you see digital disruptions impact to these areas? Uh, the second thing related to the lady's question just now was you mentioned about foreign talent, uh, Malaysian talent overseas. There's no mention about the local Malaysian talent, the people who choose to stay behind. Um, is there some way we can capitalize on that? Yeah. Thank you. Okay, um, in terms of uh, R&D to GDP, I think uh, we agree, yeah? In terms for long-term uh, growth for the country, it is uh, it's important, it's going to have positive influence. Across all different countries, from developed to developing countries, we still see uh, positive performance, yeah? Positive influence. Uh, digital disruption, uh, we agree because now you'll see that uh, it's disrupting to many different sectors. Uh, in terms uh, digitally, you will see that uh, this digital disruption are all from the digital uh, uh, large company, all the digital monopolies yeah, against the incumbent firms, to the banks, to the original manufacturers, the, to even uh, the or, uh, many of the different sectors. That means uh, digital disruption is, I think they need to work together. That means the story would be, uh, you have this, um, these digital companies Rather than they are the one who is creating, I think we can build a, a stronger ecosystem together if you try to uh, put them into partners yeah, and create the basic research plan. Yeah, this one, I, would, I, I haven't really looked at the digital disruption yet. Yeah? Um, but in terms of the fourth group, I actually have considered them before. So in fact, um, uh, I think I also wrote to Talent Corp. Yeah? So, and as in, uh, I wanted to see why, uh, why uh, for instance, Talent Corp only look at the first two. I'm not saying that whatever they do has not uh, been well. Uh, the, the effort is massive yeah, in order to attract them back, uh, you know, getting that, uh, you know, certain perks to come back to Malaysia. And of course, uh, here is uh, something that we already have. Uh, so I was asking, we can actually, in the short term, can capitalize them. But in the long term, I think we should look, still look back at our local talents. Yeah, those that has uh, stayed back, yeah, or has actually come back without even coming back. Uh, I mean, uh, this is what Talent Corp is trying to do, and I think uh, this is uh, the the effort is too huge. Uh, the investment is too low, and the amount of takers is also too low. Yeah, so I think this one I won't want to put the statistic, uh, but I'm sure you will see majority statistic is uh, they are not coming back, no matter how good you give the pearls, right? So. Why don't we just spend more on the fourth group? I fully agree. But if the fourth group is, you see that uh, they are uh, not as productive as the uh, third group, then I say that in the short term, we should actually look at the third group. Yeah, the third group. Because we are still, I still try to model Malaysia as an FDR leveraging country. Yeah, 
That means I, I, I would agree, based on Prof. Goma, we are still a FDI leveraging country. Look at what all the policies until today. We actually have a lot of foreign investment. Of course, we also have uh, outflow investment as well. But we are still, all the policy is still trying to attract uh, other, other investment into Malaysia. So uh, with all this social capital that's coming into the country, yeah, whether it's the pre-employment, all the way they stay back in Malaysia, can we make sure that they are employed here and they generate massive basic research here? I think basic research is not hard. Yeah, uh, When I graduate, actually from my first degree, when I graduate, I was working for a technology firm until before I become academic. So I love science, I love technology. Yeah, I was working for a company called Atos Origin. So I think you... So I love technology. I have no doubt, actually I regret why I didn't study uh, uh, IT. I always told my dad, yeah, you know, I, I regret, yeah. You know, uh, it's not that I can create anything, but I think uh, if I have the fundamental knowledge, maybe certain things could be different for me as well, right? Uh, I mean, yeah. Uh, thank you, Hibi, for yeah. your presentation and yeah. all the. Yeah. In the eyes, we take questions and try to answer them. <laughs> Uh, this is actually training her to face the actual examination board. <laughs> <laughs> She'll be sitting in front of seven crazy people. <laughs> Two external professors will be examining her. So you have to expect worse than this, maybe. <laughs> but looking at how she has been answering questions and so on, I think she has a fair chance to make it up. <laughs> so that's okay. One. Second question, which is even more important and which is relevant to the Sun University case. I think she is... I mean, what she has been doing in the last two or three years, uh, trying to do a PhD while serving as a full-time staff of this university is really commendable. <clears throat> you see, in a lot of the private universities in Malaysia, or even in the newer public universities in Malaysia, there is a very high percentage of uh, academic staff who doesn't have a PhD. And I think one of the government plan is to get uh, all these uh, academic staff to get their PhD. And you will see uh, a lot of the academic staff who, are, who has a master's degree, you know, so, so they are appointed as a <coughs> lecturer. But many of them has problems to, 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 to register on the PhD program and to finish it. But today, or very soon, uh, Phoebe will prove the point that actually it can be done. Yeah, because a lot of uh, academic staff, especially young academic staff, they complain about the very high workload, and I think she's doing like 20 hours of teaching a week, is that correct? Maybe, you know, that's like a school teacher's uh, workload, and yet she can actually do all this. Uh, I try to imagine if I was in her situation and having to do this, I don't think I'll make it. <laughs> so there's something, something uh, great about uh, young ladies like her, right? But actually, I believe that because uh, before her, I have supervised something like 10 PhD students, and a few of them uh, were young lecturers who actually are already married and having to pursue their PhD. I still remember one particular case, and that, that, that one is really incredible. At the point when she was doing her PhD with me, she has got seven children. <laughs> and by the time she finished, she had nine. <laughs> so she's all around productive. <laughs> So, so, I mean, I'm happy that the provost of San is here. Uh, I, think, I think we need some element of encouraging and pushing to get a lot of your staff to do PhD and so on, because I think it can be done. And uh, maybe it's just one such person who has uh, proven it in San University. So, thank you. Uh,